Three, two, one, zero, zero, and lift off. Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2008, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. Hey, welcome to Mission Control, where we respect the grind and reclaim the American dream. I am your host, Ramon Peralta from Peralta Design, and we launch brands. I am very excited today. We have a special guest, a self-described voracious, is that like a velociraptor? Yeah, voracious entrepreneur. This man just won't quit. He's a serial startup addict, but he's committed also to empowering the small guy, the small businesses. He has this philosophy of designing for the human, not the device, which I'm sure he's going to elaborate on. Please help me welcome the founder and CEO at Win Local, Mr. John Lim. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you for having me. Yes, thanks. Thanks for thanks for being here in our freshly minted uh, new studio that uh, is only going to keep getting better. But you are the inaugural guest, so uh, that's a high honor. I like that. I like to set the tone for the rest of the podcasters, that, <laughs> yeah. interviewers that come on your uh, come on your show. Yes. Yeah, so tell the audience what makes you tick. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first, I want to take a step back to your intro where you mentioned about small businesses. All right, it's one of the yes. things that that actually makes me tick, and I'm passionate about is to eliminate that word. Mm-hmm. All right. So, small business Saturdays to me is one of the most insulting things that the American <laughs> dream could possibly have. All right. And for for all you Amex listeners out there who work for Amex, you guys should should completely completely abolish that. Small business Saturdays. The, it, here's I I have a bone to pick with that comment because we've had clients that think I won't mention names, but Kevin knows who I'm talking about. Where anyone less than like fifty million dollars was considered a small business, right? So it's relative. A small business could be a mom and pop. It could be a forty nine million dollar company. You know, for some people, how do you define it? So I think there's nothing small about a small business. You know, when you think about the definition to your point of of anything from zero to 499 employees or 49 million, Mm -hmm. how someone else classifies us. Mm -hmm. But today we are the biggest contributors to the economy. The so-called small business powers more employees than any other corporations put together. Number one. Number two, right, we take the biggest risk. So we, we actually jump from our job or start a company from scratch, right, potentially mortgage our houses. We take a very big risk. So we take a big risk. We're the biggest contributors to the economy. We have big dreams, yet we're classified as small. The only small thing about us is those discounts that Amex gives us, right? You work for (laughs) JP Morgan Chase, you go to the Ritz and it's, it's 50% off. You launch a company, put your family at risk, hire 10 people, help this economy grow the American dream and you pay full price. So frankly, to me, it's always about the local business, local, right? You choose to live here. You're part of the local community. You're part of the local business. Without a local business or local business professionals in that case, there's no such thing as a community. Right? So we are, are the biggest contributors to that American dream than anyone else. So I take a lot of offense to the whole small business category that we're put in. And just think about it. Like imagine you had a, a local store and it was small business Saturday. So let me walk into your small business, right? And give you some, some love here because Amex is telling me to, to support the small business right? The small dreams you have, the small things you do. Like small is such an insulting word in that case where, hey, support the local person, the local business. Now, what if that local person is selling globally, you know, on the internet, for example? That's fine, right? The digital sector has opened up to international opportunities, Mm -hmm. but you physically chose to live in a certain community. You're local to that community, right? Your office is local to that side. Mm -hmm. You might have 15 offices around America, but they're all local. Right. Right. So you you don't have an office that sits in America as your address. It's Shelton, Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut. Right. The whole United States comes after. So in this case, you chose where to live. You chose where sometimes where you live chose you. Okay. Okay. Well, I feel like you're setting the stage for something here. Okay. You're, You're laying some bricks down for a foundation, which is cool. Let's let's go back to who you are, because you're obviously passionate. 
you know, uh, about this topic. So give our give our listeners a sense of who you are and what makes you tick. I think for me, it's always been helping other people, right? Since since I was a, a kid, the first company I opened up or first so-called business I had, like all us little kids, uh, was either a lemonade stand or a newspaper route, mm-hmm. right? So growing up in the Bronx, I had a newspaper route. Uh, I was about nine years old, did it with my grandma, uh, had amazing success in that case, right? Grew from one building to four buildings and had a lot of fun doing it. Learned a lot of things like collecting money and and laying money out and and running books for that matter, because you had to keep ledgers and, and all this crazy stuff that a nine-year-old kid has no idea. You weren't what he's cooking doing. the books at nine, were you? No, no. <laughs> okay. I couldn't make toast at that point. How did I <laughs> cook a book for that matter? But, um, you know, so we, we at that young age, yeah. it was always about the hustle, mm-hmm. right? Whether I was playing sports or, or running around the neighborhood or working a company for that matter and, and generating and revenue. Who, who, but who planted that seed in you to go work and, and be an entrepreneur at such an early age? So what happened was my parents, right? We was four children from my mom and my dad, and there was six of us in this two bedroom apartment. So we weren't poor by any means of, of mentality wise. I never felt poor, mm-hmm. but when you look back at it to where I am today, we were poor, right? So, you know, everything from, from food stamps to three boys in one bedroom, my mom, my dad, and my sister in another. Uh, so as the legend goes, my younger brother, who's 10 months younger than me, my Irish twin, he was born with a hole in his heart. Mm-hmm. All right. So my dad always had this rule. Like whenever we bought sneakers, he never bought a pair of sneakers over $50. That was his rule. I didn't get it because I was young. Right. Uh, but it made sense. He had a lot of kids and, and we couldn't afford to, to even we grew up on fish sticks for that matter. If anyone remembers what that is, uh, they took it off the shelf because it, <laughs> There's Probably no fish in it. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> okay, I don't even know if it was a stick for that matter, but yeah, somehow we had fish sticks. And by the way, I have that $50 rule in sneakers today. To this yeah. day, I still have that rule. Yeah, so like today you get to buy a <laughs> pair of shoelaces for, for the kids. That's, that's about all you're going to get for 50 bucks on these days. So anyhow, one day we go to the, the sneaker store, mm-hmm. and I played a lot of sports, so I burned through my sneakers. And he bought my brother a pair of sneakers that was more than $50. And I was like, Dad, yeah. what's up, man? Where'd... Yeah, what's up with that? Nope. Oh, your brother's got a hole in his heart, doing something nice for him, this and that. You know, I was like, all right. It really, really pissed me off. Okay. <laughs> all right. Really pissed me off because it was, it, was, it was an unfair treatment. Yeah. You know, my brother was healthy. He was running around. I know he had a hole in his heart, but he wasn't, you know, crippled by any means. We would play sports together and so forth. Mm-hmm. We should have been equal. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, it was the very next morning that it happened. But it probably was a week or so later where I talked to my grandmother. I said, hey, listen, grandma, I need to make some money. You know, she was a hustler. She was a, a, the entrepreneur in our family. She owned a diner at one point. Uh, and at this point, she was working for a clothing store, uh, Alexander's, kind of like a Macy's, if you will. Mm-hmm. And she's like, okay, I'll give you some chores and so forth. No, Grandma, I need to make some real money. Yeah. Right? I got to buy a new pair of sneakers. <laughs> I need some yeah. paper stacks. Yeah, exactly. I need to make some real money here, <laughs> right? Chores and, and, you know, your $5 that week is not going to help it. What can we do? Yeah. Uh, so she found out that a friend of ours in the neighborhood had a paper out. And he had that neighborhood. So I had to go to another neighborhood to do the paper route. So we had a little walk longer and so forth. Opened the paper out, selling the daily news. And at that point, I just kept going. Right? It gave me the freedom and the independence where I wasn't going to depend on anybody ever. What's your relationship like with your brother today? Oh, we're thick as thieves. Okay. He's my Irish twin, right? Okay. So the family itself has always stayed tight. Did he, what is he, did he grow up to be as voracious an entrepreneur as you? No. No, no, he 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 took a different path. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm I'm. That's a different break, podcast. Break, break the mold. That, that's a different podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Different all right, podcast. all right. We'll bring yeah. it back. All right. So you 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 had this entrepreneurial spirit from your grandma. She sounds like she she instilled that. You were observing her. She was you know she owned businesses and 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 you took that on. Now, when did you start your first business? Beyond like. As, as an adult, or did you go into corporate and come back out and then, and then become an entrepreneur? No. So the first actual business that, the, that I started where you have the government involved, if you right. will. You're right? paying taxes. Though. Paying taxes. You get that yeah. fancy EIN number. <laughs> yeah. Which you're super excited about up until the tax bill comes <laughs> and it's like, whoa, these numbers yeah. don't match. Yeah. Uh, so I was 19. I dropped okay. out of college at 19 okay. and I opened up a cell phone company called Global Telecom. Mm-hmm. We very rapidly became the, the fifth largest cell phone company inside of New York City. Uh, this is before your AT&T stores, Verizon stores, any of that nature. Uh, we had two locations right inside Computer City. So one in Scarsdale, one right on 40th and uh, uh, 
Sixth uh, Avenue, so right across from Bryant Park. Yep, kiosk inside of. Nice. At that point, for anyone listening who has no idea what a computer store is, you had dedicated computer stores, <laughs> right? Called Computer City and Comp USA. laughing because yeah, yeah, Comp USA. Well, yeah. That's where I, I, you know, I had a Comp USA credit card. Okay. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> we're, we're, we're us wannabe geeks and geeks back then, right? To get a computer, you didn't go to online or buy it somewhere. Right. You went to a computer store, mega right. Right. Best Buy like computer store <laughs> right, right. that existed. So uh, I put two kiosks there. Wow. Uh, worked both of them, right? So one I had just for the weekends, one I had for every single day. Selling a ton of cell phones at that particular standpoint. Uh, Computer City was like, listen, we want you now to be in every one of our locations nationwide, 286 locations, uh, something around that number. Super exciting. I would have been the largest cell phone sub store, if you will, in the entire country. And here I am celebrating success, about 20 years old now, all right, young and dumb, at it, like every other 20 year old. But think about it. Your friends are, your friends are in college. You quit and you start a business mm -hmm. and you're making money. Making money, doing very well, learning a lot of things, failing often. Uh, now I call it learning, but back then yeah. it was failing and miserable, you know, from inventory management to cash flow management to, to saving for the rainy day to how to market, you know, because we, we were basically a kiosk that we just took their traffic. Arguably learning way more than you would in business school. 100%. Right. What I, people ask me, where did I graduate college or where did I go to college? Mm -hmm. I simply say Bryant Park University. <laughs> And around the world, that works everywhere, except if you're it a New Yorker. Legit. It yeah. sounds legit. Sounds legit, right? I had this beautiful campus. Like, Wait a minute, I was ice skating there. What, what, yeah, there's right, a hobo yeah, that lives exactly. there. Yeah. Right, but in Bryant Park University, every day for lunch, I go across, I go across the street and have this nice, beautiful campus where you could play chess <laughs> or you could, you know, sit on the lawn and, and right. stretch or get some sun. So yeah. very yeah. idyllic. Yeah. Very exactly <laughs> right. People, I still people are looking up. Hey, where's Bryant Park University yeah. located? Right across the street from yeah. Bryant Park. Yeah, yeah, you went on scholarship. <laughs> exactly, <you know>? exactly. <laughs> no, listen, I, I I paid for that education. No, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I dropped out, I did that, and unfortunately, right when we were about to make that deal, CompUSA gets yeah. bought out by uh, Computer City gets bought out by CompUSA. I got forty eight hours to get my stuff out, otherwise it's owned by the liquidators. And at that standpoint, I was I was just I was done. Like I didn't I didn't know what to do. I hadn't go back to school, do something else or, or, you know, where to go. So I, uh, I took a job helping out this, uh, local store who sold like beepers and cell phones and things of that nature. Uh, my dad was friends with him. So I went there, started working for him, uh, spent about a year and a half there before I built, uh, his promotional product business, his marketing company, if you will, uh, selling all the different types of tchotchkes and promotional items. And once I built that to a million dollar business, I left. And I launched my own promotional product company, marketing company, and kept evolving from that standpoint. So from 2003 till now, uh, I've been my only boss. Wow, man, that's commendable. Thank that's you. That's commendable. And I know you've, you've gone through ups and downs where, you know, I, I visited your offices in Stanford, uh, you know, Life in Mobile, and you've, you've had... Uh, mobile real estate ID. I mean, you've had a number of companies. And one of the things that I find fascinating is how do you, what's your thought process, uh, you know, when you're going to decide whether you need to pull the plug on something and start over, how do you know when it's run its course? That's a tough question, right? Because, because I don't think we ever know. And I think as an entrepreneur is we always hold on too long, right? Because when you, your business is like your baby. Yeah. So if you have kids, it's, it's like your child, you're starting something, you're building something, you're, you're trying to grow as much as you can, you're teaching other people around it. Uh, and at some point you want it to grow itself. So I think at some point when you, you run out of money, and this is how I think a lot of entrepreneurs get into debt, we run out of money, and then we start taking money from wherever we can, or it's happened to me on multiple occasions, um, to keep it alive. Because you know that if, if you could just keep working, or you could just, you have this idea, and you're gonna work hard, it's, it's gonna work. You just need that one sale in that case. Um, I never had the benefit of a mentor right? Or, or, or someone that can help me say, listen, if you can't hit this, then you got to shut it down and move over. So every time I had to shut something down or, or evolve, if you will, um, it was survival. I, I had to evolve to survive or innovate to survive is how I, I talk about the products now. But I had no backup plan, right? I couldn't get another job. I couldn't go to corporate America. I didn't, I was a great sales guy and all sales jobs meant basically you eat what you kill. Commission. Yeah. And at that point mm -hmm. you're in so much debt, you can't just work on commission. So you, you have to do your own thing. What's been your greatest success? 
my kids. Mm-hmm. My kids are by far my my greatest success in that case. And uh, even now, my little guy, my middle child, my youngest son, has, has helped me build out different uh, templates and, and cards. And he's my he's my go to. Like, hey, what do you think about this product? Yeah, this product is great. Yeah, this product sucks. There's no in between, by the way. All right? There's no like, hey, dad, this product might work. Nope. Dad so is how, great he's been working sucks. since what age? Since he could you probably had him working since five, six. Oh, since birth. I mean, since right, right away. Right? <laughs> he, he's born post post iPad generation. Device. Yeah, exactly. here's, here's a device. You know, exactly. tell me what you think of the uh-huh. UI on this. But I think from a business standpoint, um, we've had. I, I've been blessed to have a lot of different yeah. successes. Right. Uh, one doesn't stand out more than the other, but. Making the Inc. 5000 list, not only making the Inc. 5000 list, but we were under the Inc. 1000, if you will, in that case. So that was a pretty big accomplishment, you know, coming from nothing at Life & Mobile to to build that agency to, you know, multi-million dollars in that case and, um, you know, have a staff of almost 100 people. So it was a, it was a really fun run that we had in that case. Uh, that was pretty good. And I think the international side is probably what I'm most proud of. So So building a company in a country where I don't speak the language and the company is uh, powered by something I don't innately do. So I don't code where I do all the UX, UI design and build the products, mm-hmm. but I don't actually write the code. So having that be a multi-million dollar business as well, which is challenging because you have culture, you have distance, you have people you have to trust, it really taught me how to trust other people to handle things that typically in America and a company that I built or started, I can handle. Like something goes wrong, you could, handle it. Uh, when you're 4,000 miles away, if something goes wrong, you got to really have trust in the people that you, yeah. uh, you partner with to, to handle it. So that, that's where I learned the most. Now for, and of course I'm going to ask you what's your biggest failure. That's another great question. There's so many failures to, to, to talk about. Um, I think the biggest failure led me to where I am today, right? So, so, and it was a series of failures. It was basically never sticking to one thing, right? So if you remember that movie Top Gun, right? When Maverick was in the training side, and he's like, all right, listen, you got this shot. I'm going on to the next one, or I'm going on for the bigger, the bigger gun, right? The number one guy, Viper in this case, I'm going to grab him. You can handle it. Uh, and then how it goes is he left his wingman, went after the number one, lost because the guy couldn't finish it. I was always moving on to the next. Once I got to the top of the mountain, I knew that I, I took this to where it can go and then someone else can handle it, let them handle it, go on to the next one. And that lack of focus, right, didn't allow me to build a really great company, right, a really great product. Good companies, good products. I've had a great living, right, I've been able to build a great family, but nothing really great came out of uh, that. So, those failures in every company that I've ever built, I've always had that same failure. Where now when local, I'm laser focused on one mission, right? One mission, one team, one brand, nothing else. And, and uh, to sum it up, my biggest failure was my, my lack of focus. Well, that's very, uh, you put yourself vulnerable there and I appreciate that. But I think that uh, I also believe everything we've ever gone through prepares us for where we are now. You know, and I, and I think I can I can hear that focus in your in your voice, and I believe it, my friend, and and what you've put together. And I want to get to that. I want to talk a little bit about that um, before we do, and and that's when local um, and share card. But before we get there, you started out with a device. You know, you started out with this kiosk, um, and every single iteration of you know your evolution has has involved the device. Yeah. What is it that has driven that evolution from one idea to the next, but kept that common thread of the phone? Is it something that was driven by your vision or did you see your customers interaction with the devices? And did that open up kind of a new path? Yeah. So I think if you, if you, that is definitely the first time someone mentioned that being the common theme throughout my entire career, but it is, I've always been attached to that particular device. Part of it is probably my wannabe geek side with all the technology and and, and tinkering and playing with those things. But also it was my my watching human behavior. So when I started selling cell phones in college, you just saw the the gravitational pull that it had. All right. And and how many people wanted it or used it, whether you could afford it or not afford it. It's freedom. You know, one of the things about us as humans, 
right? So there's some iterations of, of products and technologies that change the DNA of the human, right? So you think about that chart of evolution, right? You see the, 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 the gorilla that's, you know, on all fours, and the next thing you know, it becomes a human. But now that we're I human- I think we're starting to turn back into gorillas. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going back, going back into the hibernation <laughs> that side, right? Um, but you see that, and it ends yeah. at the human. But yet the human has constantly evolved, right? So, so in the early days of the light bulb, okay, which the Edison has that, that, that innovation that changed the world, yeah. it really was his grid to add more power to more light bulbs that first, these last hundred years, first changed the human DNA. Meaning you can see more, right? So you could see more and more places, you could travel more. So every time that you, ev that you evolve in that case, the more freedom you have, Okay, the, the more land you can roam, the more you learn, the more you change, right. the more you evolve, and you kept passing that DNA. Right, the next time we saw that was, was Henry Ford. When Henry Ford invented the affordable automobile, where everybody could have a car, now all of a sudden, you know, you see different aspects, right? He's credited for so many things outside of, of the car, right? He's credited for uh, different music. He's credited for national billboards, right? In his documentary, he's actually even credited for, for a sexual position because people lost you know. their inhibitions, yeah. right? To, to do different things. And then comes the internet. So the internet is the catalyst to what Jobs created, the smartphone in everybody's hand. And if you really- You heard that, Kev? Just, I just want to make sure he heard the name. <laughs> it was Jobs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. Not so, Gates, not the pirate that stole all, everything from Apple. But that's a whole nother podcast. It, it definitely is. And, and Kevin, I, I, I don't agree with that whatsoever. I think Gates gave Jobs a fair opportunity to have his stuff. Jobs was too arrogant uh, in his early career. But in his second level career, right, where he took the internet, yeah. which really wasn't around when Jobs first started creating the computer side of it, right? But when he took right. the internet and he saw that, and he got to step back and got to see that case, he then invented right, the device that once again changed us as humans. And what happens is all of those iterations just gave us as humans more freedom. You know, it was funny, in America, we called it a cell phone. So I used to sell cell phones from 1996 up until 2002, all right, 2003 for that matter. And then iPhone comes out, right? It's the first time America called the so-called cell phone or smartphone a mobile device. And I'm sitting in these meetings with these CMOs and CEOs of some larger companies. And they're like, listen, what's our mobile strategy, right? What's our mobile strategy? They kept saying the word mobile strategy. Meanwhile, it's, it's, a, it's a word from Britain, right? It's a, they had mobile devices, we had cell phones, but you wanna know what the mobile strategy is. They didn't know yet that what they were talking about is what is the strategy for the human that is mobile? And that's really where, as I saw the device iteration continue to grow, and then once I got into that, mobile sector. Once we get into the mobile evolution, if you will, where the device doesn't matter, right? I need to connect to a human that is on the go. How do I do that? And that's where the, the human for behind the device and not the device itself is really came out of that and started studying human behavior with this sixth sense being your mobile device. I mentioned that my, my, my youngest son was born post iPad. So the difference of my oldest son who's 13, he was born pre iPad, but iPhone. My other son who's 11, iPad, iPhone. My daughter who's five, iPad, iPhone, and everything else. Think about how early we're putting this device into our children's hands. They're not even a year old and they're getting this. So literally it becomes the first human scent, right? Sense that we have, our sixth sense, that we're not innately born with. Because you can't live without that device anymore. It's a complete extension of your humanity. It's an extension of your brain. It's an extension of you, right? That device is not near you. It's like saying, you take my brain out of my head and put it to the side and I'll leave the house without my brain. Even though that's pretty much how I operate before coffee. Still, that's not how you, you, you want to be. So I've just stayed with it. I think it's, 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 I always saw the future of it. I always saw the possibilities. Um, and it fascinated me how humans changed when they had that device in their hand. What impact do you think COVID ha has had on screen time and mobile devices? And so on screen time, it's, it's, it's significantly increased. Right, because now you're adding back to the, the to the second screen again, or the first screen, if you will, where the the TV is now back involved, mm -hmm. right? Because you were home, you're watching so much content. Uh, I think content is king, and kings aren't great in that case, right? So it's always been that saying: uh, there hasn't been a king 
that we could reference. That's why America has no so-called kings, because kings don't last uh, out in the Europe side. And there's not a king that someone looks at and says, oh, you know what, man? You know, Henry VIII, the guy was a great guy. We all want to emulate None of those looks. guys were great guys. None of them, right? None of them. And content is yeah, king and, and, and yeah. content, content is tough. Yeah. So the screen time has significantly increased. Uh, and I think that has led to a lot of bad actors happening in that case. There yeah. was also some good actors, right? You always have your good and your bad. Uh, and as humans, the screen time has become way too much, right? We have way too much video time and video content, which again, we think about how we learn right now, video is the number one way to alter human behavior. Okay. Cause we're, we, we learn through our eyes, right? Humans primarily learn through their eyes, right? 500 years ago, it was, it was reading and songs, right? Songs and plays, plays and movies. And now screen time whether it's a long so-called movie of TikTok and you're just scrolling through the endless video, right? Or looking at pictures that speak a thousand words on your, your Instagram or Facebook or living off of Netflix. And like when we grew up, there was no like term Netflix and chill. It wasn't like I love Lucy and chill, you know, or, or, or let's watch the honeymooners and chill. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> you were going on a date, you went to the movies or, you know, you went yeah. out to dinner. Yeah. So, Let's get down to brass tacks here, the win local, the share card. Is it truly the culmination of all your other ideas into one? Or, is, or tell us a little bit about how you came up with this concept and how you turned it into a business. It is. It is, it is the culmination of everything that I've ever done. Uh, and to come to that culmination was, was extremely difficult. So about four years ago, I was going through a divorce, right? Or a separation, right? About to go be a divorce, inevitable for that matter. Um, and that happened very, very quickly. Uh, at the same time, I was going through a divorce in my business where, where one of the gentlemen that was the president of Life and Mobile at the time, he wanted to take a different direction. All right. My main partner had just lost his brother. So here I am in a situation where we have a couple of businesses. We just took on some funding. And now I have pretty public divorce aspect that, that, that didn't work well in my, my business community. I had my business divorce that was happening. I had a cover for my, my partner who lost his brother, who was also a, a employee of ours, you know, and, and family for that case. So I was in a deep depression, all right? I lived literally five minutes walk to my, my office and I didn't want to go to work, all right? So I, I was in the apartment. I was drinking too much. I wasn't exercising. Uh, my, one of my partners today is the guy who always called me in the morning at 11 o'clock to just make sure that I was good. And it was crazy. I didn't know what I was going to do, right? I had to pay all this money out in, in the divorce and, and piece of your, your, your life. And as an entrepreneur, you, you do the things you do, right? So you have that freedom. So when you get a divorce and all of a sudden it's like, okay, listen, you're now owned for the next X amount of years that that's happening, depending on how many children you have or the business and so forth. That was really tough for me to swallow as well. So between eating bad, all right? So I think I, I think I, Definitely put the pizzeria uh, as kids through college during that time period. Uh, drinking bad, not working out or, or, or playing basketball, not focused on work. I'd sit in bed and be like, all right, what am I going to do? How long did this period last when you were in this depression? I mean, I faked that funk for about six months, right? So it was uh, almost four years ago from now, August. Um, and I faked it pretty good. I could go to the office. I do the work. Uh get my stuff done, go back, super functional. But once I got back to the apartment, or even when I was in the office, half of me was out of the office already, right? Uh, the other half couldn't wait to get out of the office. And whatever was left of me had to manage the employees that we had, right? Because I got multiple ships sinking. I got my, my family side sinking and the kids have to go through what they have to go through, uh, which tore me up when I was a young boy and my parents got separated. So I'm feeling their pain of reliving that as a childhood. So I'm living that through them, trying to do the opposite of what my dad did to help them out. I got this other ship that's sinking, which is the business side of it in, in that case, because the guy who's running this, this $5 million agency we have, uh, he wants to do other things, and, and that's struggling. We just took on an investment to launch a, a new brand called Link Nexus at the time, mm. and I'm dealing with those investors who, who have to do with that. So I got like, it's like war in that case. Did you ever feel like just ending it? Yeah, like so so... To end all of it, that, that's how it really came together, where it was like, I never felt like ending my, my life. Like, that to me was always a, a cowardly way out. I had so many responsibilities to take care of. Like, I'm a fighter in that case, right? 
uh, wartime CEO, if you will. I strive through those things. But, and that's typical. But this time, I couldn't be that person because I'd get motivated for an hour and then bam, it's like the wave of depression. It's no different than, no different than the waves in the ocean, right. right? You're standing there, you feel good, and then bam, the wave hits you. All right, get back up. You stand there, feel good, and hit again. Uh, there, was no, there was no shying away from that. So as all of that's failing, I'm literally sitting there uh, constantly thinking about, hey, what can I do? So there was, there was one morning, I'll never forget, I was in my apartment, and I lived on the 21st floor, and it was a, like all window apartment. So just imagine like there are no walls in the living room and the dining room. It's just, just windows. And I'm sitting there. I get up. It's got to be like 10 o'clock or so. Turn the coffee machine on. I got probably a, a, a quarter bottle of the vodka left that I was drinking the night before. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm not going to work today. So let me just finish off this bottle of vodka and uh, watch some TV and veg out a little bit. And then I wake up later on and, you know, I don't have my kids tonight, so that's fine. And then tomorrow will be a new day and we'll get through it. I'm already thinking about tomorrow as a new day and it's like 1030 <laughs> in the morning. Right? The day has the day still a puppy. Mm. Right. So, so, and I'm very big on maximizing that 1440 minutes. But at this point in my life, it was like, how can those minutes go faster so I can get to the next day? Because the next day is going to be different. The next day is going to be different. And the next day was never different. So finally, I'm looking at and my coffee machine is, is, is right in the corner of the kitchen. A bottle of vodka is right next to it. All right. My mind, I'm almost thinking like, hey, I'll have an espresso martini in the morning. So accomplish both. All these crazy justifications. And finally, I thought about my kids. Right? I thought about my kids and I saw myself. And there's a thing that you learn in life where, where it's, as an adult, okay, as we go through all the stuff that we went through and, and whether you had good childhood, bad childhood, your inner child never leaves you. So as an adult, you have to protect your inner child, right? That's our emotional state, our subconscious state. And to do that, once in a while, you got to look in the mirror and say, okay, little John in there, right? The inner child that can't defend himself, can't have all the stuff that we have. How are you going to protect that child today? And for me, that was difficult to see, yet I saw my son, both of my sons, who were the same age that my mom and dad left, who were the same age. So I got to see their face and see their picture and be like, all right, cool. That wartime CEO just came out. Didn't touch the vodka, right? Uh, that day, actually poured it down the drain, made a, a quadruple espresso, took a marker, and I started writing on the windows like a whiteboard, okay, uh, what I owned. So I said, all right, you know, I own a text messaging platform. Okay, that still patents. works. I own patents, right? At this point, I had uh, eight patents. Now we have 12. I'm like, all right, I own some patents. Uh, I own um, this brand, when local. I own, I own a trademark. Uh, I own data from real estate data. I started putting a list of all the assets that I had that were functional and still worked. So I wasn't going deep to like, oh, I have this old platform and this old URL. Nope. Things that I can actually go today. I, I know how to sell. I know these promotional products. I have all these things. So I started writing it down. And uh, once I wrote it down, it took up like an entire window of things. I was like, all right, it's not so grim. I got a lot of things that I can do and I can make a living tomorrow even if I left it all behind. Or I gave it all up, let all the partners have it. Say, guys, you know what? I'm starting fresh. I couldn't do that to them, but I started having a little bit more confidence as the hours came together because we had a lot of things. So then I started writing out, okay, well, let's say I did this thing. How do I tackle, how do I add these things together? And next thing you know, I look up and it's like 11 o'clock at night and I'm on fire. My brain is on fire, right? I mean, I must have had more espresso than any human on the planet at that point, but my brain's on fire and almost every window's covered. Every window's covered with an idea, a marketing idea, a product idea, something that showed growth, right? Because I learned early on, if you're not growing, you're dying. And at that point, I was slowly dying every single day because there was no growth, right? I, didn't, I wasn't reading. I wasn't, right. I wasn't looking at things that had any positive impact in life. I was only looking at the negative. How do I get through the day as quick as possible by doing nothing? And I would numb myself with TV, alcohol, right? Anything that avoided what I had to face. And that one day changed everything. So then I took a pad, I highlighted all the things on the window that, that I knew I could make a business out of, uh, and that's how I went local camp, that we own that trademark, I took that trademark, and I started looking at it saying, okay, how can I go back to my passion and help out, help out the so-called little guys you mentioned earlier today, right? How can I level the playing field for that local business, right? You know, how can I help the people that, like me, don't have any mentor to help them out 
uh, and take the 20 years of stuff that I've been going through and the pain and the, the learnings and the failures and all that, how can I give back? Because if I can do that, then that gives me another life fulfilling element. And out of that, there'll be success. Awesome. So, I mean, that's very cathartic. And I think that uh, our listeners are going to really identify with that because we don't, as entrepreneurs, we always, uh, we share all the positive highlights and everybody sees like the ending of the movie and how great it all ends and everything. Uh, but there's so much uh, turmoil and pain and, and uh, suffering and, and uh, soul searching that, that, that happens that uh, is, it's very important to share so that people get inspired. Um, I love what you've put together, um, I, you know, and, and I, I believe that when you're sincerely uh, trying to help people and you've got something that that's different and unique, uh, then, then you've got the formula for success. And it sounds to me like you need to explain a little bit to our listeners what this uh, world's most intelligent card is, because when local is your company share card is the product that you've launched. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's going to revolutionize networking. It's going to help people. Um, and there are some cards out there. There's some competitors. You know, we've seen, like, I think I've sent you the link to uh, Vice mm -hmm. or Vice One. Uh, and, and we're seeing these cards. And, and with COVID now, nobody wants to, like, exchange physical paper cards, you know. So tell our listeners what's so special about share card and who the ideal client for you is and how they can reach you so they can sign up for this bad boy. So the reason we call it the world's most intelligent card is because it literally is an extension of the person who has the card, right? So it's not just about transferring contact information, right? It's about making appointments. You can request a mortgage. You can, you can buy things in that case, right? Without transaction fees, uh, leveraging PayPal and Venmo and all these great companies that set up the ability to quickly help each other by transferring money, zeal, you name it, in those cases. So it's the world's most intelligent card because I believe that each inside of each one of us, we are the world's most intelligent person to ourselves, right? And that can translate to others. So the card is an extension of yourself. And how it really came about in 2006, uh, when I had the marketing company, it's the first time that I invented something from scratch, right? And in 2006, I invented something called the mobile business card. And I invented it out of a necessity. So here I am at networking events and there's no iPhone, there's no LinkedIn, there's no Facebook, right? There's only Tom from MySpace. And if you don't know Tom from MySpace, then you are definitely lower, de de definitely younger than, than all of us in this room. But Tom from MySpace, everybody's friend in America at that point, that's all that existed. So at every networking event that I went to, every place that I had, I hand out cards like crazy. Okay, my grandma taught me when I was young that, that if you want to be successful in life, you work hard. The harder you work, the more successful you're going to be. And that was true for, for her generation, my parents' generation, when we were kids, all of that made sense. But as soon as the digital world came into play, it didn't make sense anymore, right? Because I would engage as many people as I could in 2006. And if you didn't have your business card on you, or you chose not to give me your business card, my entire future was dependent on you calling me. Right? I couldn't follow up. There was no CRMs or emails or things like that. There's, there's no way for me to, to, to have this machine that would automate the follow-up. Especially, there's no way for me to find you if you didn't give me your information. So I invented something called the mobile business card, which at the time, the number one phone in the market was the Motorola Razor, right? If you don't know what that is, look it up. It was a great phone. But I would text you my card to your phone, and simultaneously, I would get your name and your phone number in my online database that the very next day, I can call you and follow up, okay? And then you had my phone number in your phone because I texted you the phone number, along with all my other contact information. No ability to download, no fancy V card yet, but that was the iteration. So fast forward from 2006 until what the share card is now, uh, COVID allowed me to, to reinvent that card. I always wanted to come back to it and enhance it and do something different with it. Uh, when we launched Win Local originally in 2020 in April, the world was shut down. We couldn't help these local businesses because they weren't even open. So I sat down, I looked at the mobile business card and I said, all right, how do we reinvent this? How do we leverage all the technology that I've loved, but the world wasn't ready for? And NFC was something I was always passionate about. I was lucky enough to go to Nokia's headquarters when Nokia was the company back then uh, in Finland, play with their NFC technology, really learn how this, this little tag works, and then now how to manifest it into where we are today. So the share card, to me, 
is the hardest working tool that you're going to have in the future. So unlike our, our, our competitors, if you will, right, or, or anyone out there that's doing QR codes or, or tap technology in that case, right. um, what makes us different is the more you engage, the more you engage, the harder you work, the more successful you're going to be because of our re-engaging technology. So unlike all of our competitors or anyone that's, that's leveraging this technology, every time that card is tapped or scanned or you text in for it, we're building you a database of people that you can re-engage with without data entry. So what that means is when you go out there and hustle and network or meet people or be that outgoing person you want to be, engage people with your card, we're building a database of people that you can re-engage with on Instagram and Facebook, now LinkedIn, and in Q1, uh, TikTok, uh, as well as Google. The harder you work, the more you can re-engage, the more successful you're going to be. And part of that is to level the playing field for all of these local businesses and local professionals that have to be certified to, to reach people on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, whatever new network is going to come out that we don't know about yet, Google. It's all too difficult. So we simplified the process. Hand me your card. Engage with me. Let's have a conversation. Great. If you give me your information or not, no problem. I could re-engage you across social media automatically without data entry. That's huge. So now what does this cost a small business? Is there an enterprise? Is it a subscription? How do you use it? How do you pay for it? It's either 10 bucks a month or you get the card for hundred dollars for the year. All right. So we're giving away the card and a tag to the kit. We're giving you text messaging, your own text code, your own QR code, all that technology, right? At that rate, because it shouldn't be that expensive, all right? This technology doesn't cost a lot and, and engaging is what I want people to do. So when they re-engage, have a better opportunity to grow their business. So it's extremely affordable. Excellent, man. So where do people sign up for it? Winlocal.com. Winlocal.com is the website uh, that is relaunching in about four weeks. Uh, you can go there now to see all the great stuff that we do. Uh, but we have a whole new share card uh, kit coming out so you guys can, can see it there and see how it's used with other people, get different ideas. And I love to take feedback. So when you see it and you play with it, any feedback you guys have, how to further make it the world's most intelligent card, definitely provide feedback. How can they reach you? Give out your uh, contact info real quick. So it's simple. You can take your phone out. Okay, You can text John, J-O-H-N, to the phone number 88500. Or you can go old school, like all of you AOL email addressers out there today. Like Kev. Uh, like Kev. You can go old school. <laughs> and uh, you can also email me at john at winlocal.com. All right. But I definitely encourage the text message. You'll get a feel of how the card works, how simple it is, uh, and how you can grow your business leveraging this technology. Excellent, man. Great story. Lastly, I'm going to ask you, what words of advice would you give those out there that are trying to start, that have an idea, but they don't know what to do with it? So the first thing is be where your feet are, right? Be where your feet are is a tool that, that makes you present. Because too often, going back to the screens and other things, and even when you have an idea, you're already way too ahead. Right? You're thinking about uh, 10 years, five years, as far as you can go with it. Mm -hmm. First thing you got to do, you come up with that idea, right? Look at your feet. It'll automatically make you present into that room that you're in, all right? So you're, now you're present. Now think about the idea that you have, right? And think about how it's a need. How can I get this in the hands of people that need it? And does anyone need it? I'm very strong in the need and the want words, right? We talk about all these things that we so-called need, but we really want them. If you have an idea and you want to start a business, the first thing that I would do is take a whiteboard or a piece of paper and write down all the reasons why it won't work. Beat it up, right? Be your worst enemy and say, okay, this, is a, this idea is not going to work because of all of these reasons. Because then when you see that, you'll automatically be able to look at it and say, okay, I can overcome all the 10 things that me, the person who's thinking about the business, just destroyed about the business. And I can fix those things before I even start and then get together and launch the company. Awesome. John, thanks for coming in. Always a pleasure, all man. Right, thanks man. for having me. I wish you all the success in the world. And I want to thank everybody out there for listening and remind you all to like and subscribe to Mission Control. Until next time, this is Ramon Peralta from Peralta Design and We Launch Brands. Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work, 
go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew.